Oh. What's that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's tied it up and you're just firing up. I just, yeah. All right, we're good. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, folks. How you all doing? Uh, my name is uh, Mark Huthi. I actually work here. I'm the director for the Center for Cyber Security, and I, I chair a, a computer network security undergraduate degree program. And Anthony Carcillo in the back chairs our information insurance master's degree uh, program. And, uh, okay, how many people have been successfully hacked? It's been big ones. Okay, just once. How many people have been victimized twice? Not sure. Nobody? Three times? Okay, I'm the expert in the room on being a victim. All right, so this is. Uh, how to perpetrate a phishing attack on Wells Fargo Bank without really trying. And uh, you know, I had some alternate titles for it, but suboptimal knowledge can do for you. And another title I had was Why Me? All right, so this is uh, intended to reach a broad audience, so if some of this is too simplistic for you, please bear with me. So I'm going to demonstrate a phishing attack, we'll look at some code, we'll follow a trail of a successful attack, and we'll explore victim ethics. Anybody not know what phishing is? I want to put you on the spot there. All right, just briefly, uh, knowing how how the web works is helpful. So you have a user working on a form. Browser gets it from a web server, the form's pulled up. Using a, a get or, or a post request, that data is filled into the form and sent back to a program on either that server or another server to process it. Okay. So what we you have got mail. Sorry folks, I meant to turn it's that down. Aren't they all? It's really early. I'm gonna have to handle this folks. I really really uh, apologize for that. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, here it is. Hmm. Okay, it's Wells Fargo Bank credit card holder. Yeah, I gotta update my account because it's uh, otherwise they're gonna suspend it. It looks pretty good, right? I should be okay. I should. I can click on this link. No problem. All right. So let's see what we got here. Sure, it looks like. What's the All right, I gotta. I gotta handle this first. But you know, I should be a little more careful, right? right? So I'll check out the privacy policy. Looks good. Okay. I feel relieved, you know. I thought this might be a focus site, but I'm looking up here at the URL looks good, wellsfargo.com. This will only take a minute. Four, oops. Hmm? So, uh, let's see, it's uh, 444555 I was really fortunate, you know, not many people get a a number that's so easy to remember. I use the same pin I have on my uh, Bluetooth, zero, 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 zero. <laughs> and uh, let's see, it's uh, 0515. Uh, CBB, uh, let's see, it's uh, another easy one, one, two, three. Okay, I'm ready. Should I do it? Go for it. <laughs> it's not your credit card, right? Okay. All right, so 
I feel relieved we can get back to to what we were looking at before. And hmm, okay, this is uh, okay. So we have here. Just trying to put get the. Uh, Okay, so we have, uh, we're going to take a look at an email account of a user named uh, Nefarious. I don't know where he came up with that name. Hmm. Information looks familiar? I hate giving up my password like that, but you know. <laughs> what fish is that? Uh, Ubuntu, 13.04. All right, so. So this is really the tale of two victims. I just showed you the uh, user side of it. And looking into, I mean, I think some or all of you saw this, what's going on is that here's an example of a phishing email. And the key is what you see is not what you get. So that's what you see. But if you hover the mouse pointer over it, you get a look at the bottom of the status bar, and this particular one goes to Love Pink in France, so it's not really Wilmington Trust. And that's because in HTT, uh, HTML, you've got the piece that shows up in blue, which can just be clicked here. It happens to match the URL that it wanted to look like the actual perpetrator, and then there's the, uh, in pink there, or magenta, is where it actually goes. Okay, so now, um, what I have, I have a web server running on my laptop, and I have a, a local email running on my laptop. So what I did is I, I ran the phishing attack locally, did not go out over the internet. Now, systems administrators out there, uh, you know, how would you feel about getting an email like this, which I got December 21st, 2005, a few days before Christmas, I'm reading it over my, my morning coffee. It talks about fraudulent activity at www.wcitac.org. That's a web server that we run for the students. It used to be Wilmington College uh, uh, Division of Information Technology and Advanced Communications. And uh, it tells me that this company, Brand Dimensions, is contacting me on behalf of Wells Fargo Bank because it's experiencing a phishing attack, which is being perpetrated by an internet uh, domain that I'm charging. Now, how do you feel when you get that? What do you think? Yeah, but what if it's real? What if it's real? And the phishing server has been set up on your system. Right? Not good, is it? And the other thing is, if you look further down, right here, the incident response team. There's only one to caller in Singapore. So that's uh, that was a little unsettling. Fortunately, this was a, a non-production server, and it was connected through a Comcast modem uh, with a Comcast business account. And uh, what I did is I called up the, the secretary and said, "There's something at home drinking my coffee." I said, "Please turn off the modem." So what happened? Well, I had uh, an 11-year-old daughter. I mean, she's 19 now, she was not 11 there. That's her Murano, she's about three there. And she wanted to learn how to use uh, the web. So I set up an account for her, named it Dana, and I wanted to give her a simple password, password of Dana. Anybody wincing right now? And that's what happened. That was the, the key. Okay, so I mentioned how we simulated this attack. Ah, okay, let's take a look at uh, wellspargo.com. And here it is. 
So I think uh, Dave Decker there looked before at that form, and wellsfargo.com was not the first piece. It was like update.ru slash wellsfargo.com, which made wellsfargo.com simply a subdirectory, a folder on the server. So here's the folder that is reproduced from this actual attack. And uh, maybe what I should do is take first through the log file. So here's the log file. I went in there, I went into the school, and I called up Chris Shanahan, who's a detective for Newcastle County Police, and Phil did this from forensics lab. Detective for about 17 years, really sharp. Chris said, okay, pull up uh, the high-tech crime scene, Delaware high-tech crime scene. So we spent about three hours going through this stuff. And if you look in here, this log file, this is the actual log file, this is what we saw. So I don't have any users named WGET or TAR or Aaron or Abe or Abel on my system. So you ever sit sitting around at home and the phone rings, right? You pick it up and there's like a three second delay and then a, a telephone solicitor gets on the phone. Same thing. So here's this dictionary based attack. In most cases, they guess just once. SSH attack. So they're trying to log in via SSH, guess just once. And uh, I know that at least one of those guesses is that the password matches the username. And in fact, I never really thought of having insecure usernames. I mean, insecure passwords, sure. But what this used, among other things, was common first names. So if I do a search in here for Dana, well, there's Laura Dana. And here's Dana. Now, I have to give Grand Dimensions cre uh, credit because they, they caught this attack within 12 hours of where the server got set up. So that, that was pretty, pretty quick. So this is big old files, represents about two or three weeks worth of stuff. And Put in a little script to see, well, what's going on here? Where is this stuff coming from? Yeah, okay. A little Python script. So going through this whole file, these are the countries from which the attacks are coming in. And this particular attack came in from Shanghai. Again, this is over about a two-week period. Pardon? No, to get live in. So they were guessing that the password was the same as the username. Just once. And they, they guessed a good username and they guessed a good password. And then once the script got in, then it tagged the hacker. They said, okay, we've got a live in. So back then, there were 15,221 attempts to log into this .org that really wasn't much of anything. And I guess it's good news, I'm not sure, but I, I pulled down a log file today, and um, took a look at a similar server today. This is what we found for the, from the past week. The good news is the number of attacks are down to just the hundreds. Question for you. Yeah. Why aren't you running something to prevent uh, people from uh, making repeat, uh, well, blocking an IP that makes a few repeated uh, wrong logs? This was a this is a non-production server, and that's certainly something I can do because I know I don't have any students in uh, uh, in Korea or China or India or Germany. I could easily blacklist it. So as soon as I get multiple attacks from uh, countries like this, I could do that. You're right, I could do that. And part of the problem is, you know, I don't have the time. It's just me and my whole job, and then this little thing over here. And I should have more time to do it, but I don't. 
And these are attempts, to the best of my knowledge, they haven't been able to get in the same way again. Okay, so there's that. And then, um, right, I learned something pretty good, pretty cool from, from uh, what these guys were doing. So here, looking at the website on, on the uh, local system on this laptop here, I do an LS, LS minus, uh, minus L, I think. Minus L, I think. All right. Somebody please name me all of the hidden files or directories on that system. So-called hidden under Linux. Not secure, right? That's it, right? Nobody else? Look at that first line up there. Hold the name of blank. So a systems administrator, when you're looking over this thing, how easy is it to miss that hidden directory that's been set up? I, I thought that was pretty neat. So, there's uh, one of the nice things with, with, uh, with Linux is you can look at all the commands that somebody that's logged in has run. So, for instance, if I look at my home directory, So this is showing all the commands that I've run recently. Guess what I have from when the system got attacked? The same thing. The commands that the attacker, when he or she logged in as Dana, uh, did. So this is, uh, now, it wasn't just Wells Fargo. I give Wells Fargo credit because the attack was, was identified within 12 hours. But once the attacker broke in, well, why just one phishing attack? Why not do five? So there, there was a credit union, some other uh, organizations like that that don't have the wherewithal of uh, Wells Fargo. So here, here's where the attacker came in and said, OK, I'm going to download my, my web server from this.org over here, which was probably already compromised. Then unzipped it, changed the uh, uh, access rights to it, played around with it, decided, you know what? I don't really like this. It's so, uh, I gotta go fix it. Went back to the mothership, so deleted the whole whole uh, folder there, and then downloaded the finished copy. And this is more of the same. Here's where .secure was created. I'm not sure what they really needed that. Uh, actually, that's where the server was set up. And then here's where they created their directory name blank and set up their root kits just before they, they exited. Here's what the PHP code looks like that captured the uh, information from the credit card. So this is the action uh, program for the, the, the uh, web form. See where, where it's building username, password, credit card information, and all that other good stuff. These are the actual email accounts that they were originally emailed to. I commented those out, and this is how uh, it was emailed to Nefarious running on the local server here. Okay, that takes care of that. So that was wellsfargo.com. 
we took a look in the messages log. We just looked at uh, the uh, PHP code. Showed you, showed you this stuff too. So the consequences. What was the crime that was committed? Okay. Who has jurisdiction over it? The tech came in from Shanghai. Three Thousand County Police, State Police, FBI have jurisdiction over Shanghai. So then, you know what? The long and the short of it is, the State High Tech Crimes Unit they took the server and they, they brought it down to Dover, and they've been trained in Linux. Guess how much they work in Linux on a day-to-day -day basis? Right, seventy-five percent of their time, time in, back then, and I don't think it's changed, is spent on child predators. So where do you think that this ranks in that whole list of criminal activity in terms of setting priorities? Victim ethics. What do you think I mean by that? You guys probably know. You're thinking about it right now, right? Should I? Now, I was looking at that system, and I had lax security on it because I had no uh, confidential information on there. I had no intellectual property on there. I had no private information on there. I figured it had no value. Was I being ethical about that? Did I not have a responsibility to the world at large to do better than that? Nobody? Anyway, that's uh, that's the conclusion of uh, my talk here. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. So, just to be clear, the email that you got was a real email yes. from a company? Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because at the time, you know, I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm in deep trouble, right? I set up a phishing attack against Wells Fargo Bank, whether I knew it or not. So, I, I contacted the director of security. Uh, of information security at Wells Fargo, and, and he just wanted me to shut it down. He said, you know, there are 20 of these being set up per day. 20 per day. So that's, uh, yeah. I've often heard that academic institutions are often prime resources for these types of attacks. Oh, yeah. So because we have a strong network system, we can. So I was just wondering, I mean, yes, phishing, Well, yeah. one thing, there's no way IT wanted me to have this system on, on the production network. That's why it was on a separate Comcast business unit. So we were doing web development at the time and, and other uh, systems administrator type things. So this was set up so students could try something out and you know if they if they screwed up, they could pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and move on, no harm done. And you know, I didn't anticipate this. So when you turned it over to the authorities, that was your sort of, that's something you did on your own, right? They didn't come after you. Right. So you went to the authorities and said, hey, my boss was hacked. Yep. Put it on your, I guess, priority list. Did they ever get to it? No. And I got they, the box back, but there, there was no time, no bandwidth for it. Gotcha. So you got the box back, and as far as you know, there was no action taken from their perspective. Right. I, I uh, saw a presentation by, I think it was Baltimore City Police about five years ago on this, uh, on digital forensics. And they were talking about how their team of five, five years before, and I said, wait a minute, how many people do you have now? I said, five. So in five years, their team of five was still five. But we all know what Moore's Law did in that time. And he was telling me that what it's gotten down to is uh, they had a particular crime that they were investigating where there were 10 or 11 systems set up in a house. And there's a time frame by which, you know, due process requires a, a, that a, a suspect has to be brought to trial. They had to pick and choose which systems to look at because they didn't have the bandwidth to look at them all. And, you know, the other thing is if you want to be a uh, a police digital forensics inspect, uh, investigator. I don't know if this is still true. I believe it's still to be true. You have to basically walk the beat for five years 
before you can do this. I have heard that too. Yeah, so who wants to go to school for computer forensics? No, you're not going to be using it for five years. Any other questions? Going back to uh, victim ethics. Yeah. Um, and maybe this is outside of your area, but could either Wells Fargo or one of the victims of the phishing attack, which happens to be civil, they decided you are a system admin, you should have been responsible for securing the box. I guess they could, but then, you know, my pockets are very deep. Well, as a representative of the institution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I would think that would be a risk. I would think that would be a risk. But, you know, other sides of it is, uh, we got, I got a call from a guy, this is a little off topic, but it's in the same realm, a week ago. He said, you know, I, I just, I've just been hacked, I want to talk to somebody about it. And this was a, a variation of the Nigerian uh, print scam. So you got the call at home, and if anybody else has got the same call, just you know, give a shout out there. Where it's a person with an Indian accent claiming to be for tech support for Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah. You guys all got that, right? Yeah. I got that too, and I don't run Microsoft at home. So you know, I, I kind of had a feeling that was bogus. Well, this guy didn't. I mean, he has trouble getting an email address together. So it was, he went for it. So they charged him $149 to remotely log into a system to clean it up. But because they were decent people, they said, you know, we tried to refund your money, because you used the bank card. We tried to refund your, your money, but your bank refused it. However, we can do it through Western Union. That's good, right? But the amount's not large enough. So you have to send a check for an additional $200. And then we'll refund the full amount. You know, it has to be in the five hundred dollar range before Western Union will handle. And oh, by the way, if you have a problem, uh, here's a telephone number you can call for tech support. A nine hundred number. So that's. And, and I called up. I called up the FBI because I'm a member of the Emperor Guard, uh, which is a public-private partnership with the FBI. And they get so much of this stuff that that wasn't anywhere near the threshold for where it should be reported, uh, where they can do anything about it. That's why you have IC3.gov. You know, my advice to the, the victim, and which came through the FBI, was file a complaint in IC3.gov if they can get an aggregate where there's a thousand of these going on, and it's clear it's the same perpetrators, then they'll go after it. They just don't have the bandwidth otherwise. I can see about five of those calls, and some of them actually got recorded and put up on my website. So one of them called me while I was drunk, which was an you know, interesting say, scenario. Say this one again. I got some of those calls recorded. Yeah. One of them called me actually while I was drunk, which ended up interesting results. But um, I, I don't see those ones, I don't understand how people fall for them because every one I've ever received, they are so hard to understand that I can see my, 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 say my grandparents. Yeah. Or I don't that, but, you know, I don't see how they'd ever be able to, you know, go through anything without telling them because it, it wasn't understandable. And if you anyone have fun of them, Tell them you're on a Linux box and have them repeat the exact same thing over and over again. If you vary from the script at all, they they keep going on the script. It's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's, what's, what's the site that we have that post? Um, it's on ironheek.com someplace. I need to put it. Ironheek.com. But uh, I'll, I'll post it to Twitter again. Oh, thank you. Nobody else wondered about the other two times I was successfully hacked? Just, just briefly, once uh, I got, um, we were trying to hook up a SAN, not a SAN, a NAS, a lazy NAS to this Linux system. And it didn't support Linux. So we tried and tried and tried and it didn't work. Forgot that we had enabled SAN rules. So then all of a sudden, uh, we we're, we're had a number of students on the system that uh, were developing uh, web programs. And the instructor calls me and says, you know, Apache's down. Apache never goes down. By itself, the whole system might go down, but not just Apache. So I, I logged on and I looked in the authentication log file, found that I had remotely logged in from Romania two weeks before. But you know, I checked my passport and I hadn't been to Romania. But I, you know, my memory's not so good. I thought maybe I had overlooked it. And uh, the interesting thing with that. So now, now I'm backing everything up. I know it's been hacked. And. Uh, about two weeks go by, and now I try and I, I look in the lock file again, 
and I see this dictionary attack against user bin. Anybody see anything wrong with that? User bin on a Linux system? That's just a system account. It's not a shell account. Nobody should have an SSH login against as user bin, and it succeeded. So I'm seeing 20 like attempts to log in as bin, and the last one succeeds. I can start thinking, you know, this hacker must be playing with me because seeing all the activity I, I'm doing besides this. And then, I guess when when he figured that, or she figured that there was no further value, disabled the shell. So I locked in, I couldn't do ls, I couldn't do cd, I couldn't do ts. Surprisingly, the s, the uh, uh, SSH commands work. So I forget which which utility it is. I don't use it very often. Where you can you can move files around. You can uh, with s with uh, SSH. One of the putty commands. I forget which one it is. And then the other was uh, I've developed a a uh, content management system for a glider club. And uh, I did it from a textbook because I was going to teach PHP. I learned how to how to PhD from this book and it had how to do this content management system. And with it, you know, you've got the get requests in HTML and you've got the parameters on the end. Well, the parameter or the variables on the end picked up which code I wanted to run based on which button was clicked. I didn't check to make sure that the code was local. So somehow an attacker figured out. From this custom code, I didn't. I mean, I wrote it from scratch. Could be used to download spam code, spam generating code to run on my server. And I found out about this because my ISP shut me down, and AOL blackballed. And you know, try and get unblackball, uh, unblacklisted from AOL. They'll never talk to the developer. They'll only talk to the ISP. So it was uh, took months to get. Get that straight, man. That's all I got, folks. You've been a wonderful audience.